To start with, I would, I would like to thank you all who are still here, because it's uh, not that obvious that people are going to uh, uh, retain uh, focus and interest in uh, this type of uh, uh, half-day event. Um, I would like to first introduce you to a slightly different format, because we are not going to have any presentations, we are going to have a discussion. Uh, this session is also a part of another project uh, that is called New Pole Factor, the project that we we have been conducting together with uh, the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation in uh, uh, Warsaw, where we look at uh, the Polish and the Norwegian approaches to security in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine. And uh, we know, uh, we have learned a lot about uh, uh, the impact the war has had on the public opinion in Russia, about the public mood in Russia. Uh, the three previous sessions were mostly devoted to those uh, questions, to addressing those questions. Now we are going to look at uh, how this war has impacted on Russia's relations with, the, with some other actors. And um, uh, the war uh, triggered a number of um, uh, uh, responses. One of uh, the responses was the fact that um, the geopolitical landscapes around uh, Russia has uh, changed rather dramatically. Uh, one of the official motivations uh, for uh, Putin to go to war against the, uh, Ukraine was uh, to stop the, uh, what he perceived as a coming NATO enlargement. Uh, he launched the war. Uh, the war did not uh, go as uh, he supposed to go. Uh, the Kiev was not uh, uh, put under control in the scope of uh, uh, days or weeks as it was most probably expected. Um, and the war has also had a number of uh, other consequences. And one of those consequences is uh, something that I will ask uh, our uh, partners in this uh, panel to uh, dwell a little bit upon. Uh, I have, uh, I, have a, I have a very good opportunity being joined by three uh, colleagues working on various aspects on, of security in uh, uh, the broader European uh, context. Uh, first, we have uh, Mina Olander from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, who has been doing a lot of um, interesting um, uh, studies on uh, uh, the impact of um, uh, uh, NATO on uh, the choices made by the Finnish uh, government and uh, 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 people. Uh, so she will uh, share some of her thoughts about uh, uh, the NATO enlargement, uh, what has been the most, the most important uh, uh, triggers in the public debate in Finland. Then we also have uh, Zbigniew uh, 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 Pisarski, who has uh, played a major part in uh, shaping the uh, Central European thinking about security because he is one of the co-organizers of the biggest uh, international security conference in uh, Central Europe, the Warsaw Security Forum. He has been one of the founders of the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation, and uh, the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation is uh, the main organizer of the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, it was the 11th uh, edition of the forum this year, uh, 2,500 people uh, joining to discuss various aspects of European security. So we expect that he is uh, going to be able to share some of his thoughts about the broader context of European security, how the world has impacted on um, uh, security thinking in uh, Central Europe uh, uh, with some focus on uh, Poland. Poland has also gone uh, to a different uh, set of, uh, uh, had to address different set of uh, challenges and uh, this is also important to learn a little bit more about. And then we have uh, Kadri Lik. Uh, Kadri is uh, an expert working on uh, Russian policy matters and uh, on Russia's relations with uh, Europe um, uh, over the past uh, several years for the European Council of foreign relations. She has been involved in a number of uh, studies and surveys on uh, uh, trying to map uh, the attitudes in Russia towards cooperation with Europe, but also on how the European uh, actors have responded to those uh, Russian attempts at building various types of relations with them. And uh, I asked Kadri to uh, share with us her insights on how uh, this whole situation is being addressed by the Russian political class and what this can tell us about uh, the future of uh, Russia's relations with Europe uh, and uh, so on. So I will uh, start by asking three questions. The first one would go to Mina, the second one 
would go to Zbigniew and the third one would go to Kadri. I will ask you to not use more than maybe five minutes on those initial questions, so we have a kind of opportunity to have some more exchange of views amongst others, amongst ourselves, but also we also would like to open for questions for the audience. My first question that would go to Mina. What has been the main uh, uh, trigger of uh, the debate in Finland on NATO uh, and NATO membership? We know that Finland uh, for uh, more than uh, uh, for, for several decades uh, tried to uh, navigate between the West and the East. In 1995, Finland joined the European Union, but the idea of Finland joining NATO seemed to, to be uh, off the uh, agenda for many years. But then uh, something happens in Europe, and then uh, the the Finnish authorities and the Finnish audience uh, shifts uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, attitudes, and uh, uh, the membership in NATO is a fact after is, is a fact after two years of um, uh, debates, uh, and uh, now the situation has changed. How this uh, may also impact on the whole situation in in the region, and uh, in uh, in uh, uh, how this also is going to influence Finland's relations with Russia? Please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will. So, so there's a long story and there's a short story, and I will try to tell something in between. But basically, if we look at what you also mentioned, uh, why Finland didn't join uh, any earlier, um, there were several moments where Finland could have maybe uh, considered it. So the first one was clearly when Finland joined the EU in the 90s. But at that time, the political leadership considered it to be too much an overstretch to do both NATO and EU integration at the same time. So the EU was prioritized. Then if we look at the 2000s, um, when, uh, for example, there was the Eastern enlargement uh, with Poland joining already in 1999, and then uh, also the Baltic states uh, uh, shortly after. Um, well, I would say that, of course, there was the question of, uh, for, for Finnish political elites, it was the question of, like, uh, is this the right moment to do this? Is this the, are you hearing me? Well, okay, no. Uh, is this the right moment to do this? Is this the right uh, framework group? Are you hearing me or not? Yeah, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. good. Um, and um, so, should I, should I take that? Yes, of course. Some interventions. Thank you. All right. Uh, pardon my hair now, but anyways. Um, so, um, okay, let me just get this literally out of my hair. Here we go. Uh, so. One thing that was pretty important in the early 2000s, why Finland, um, why, why it wouldn't have been maybe the best moment for Finland to join NATO, was that in Finland this focus on territorial defense and the need of it never went away, even after the, the Cold War. Um, and in the 2000s, NATO was very much focused on the crisis management era, expeditionary operations, out of area operations. With, with like small professional uh, forces and so on. And uh, so the, the Finnish and the NATO threat assessments were like very far apart actually. And then 2014 was of course like a very good question why it didn't happen then. There was a surge in the, in the discussion about the potential NATO membership, but the, the political leadership decided at the time that it was not a good moment um, to to go for this option and make it a big political discussion because the public opinion was still much less clear than two years ago or two and a half years ago. Then now we get to the actually short story uh, of this. Uh, and that was that Finland had had, on the official level, Finland had had for years uh, the so-called NATO option policy, which was sort of like a response to the very regular Russian threats about uh, potential consequences if Finland joins NATO. And the NATO option basically said that, okay, we uh, stay non-allied as long as it suits us, but if the security environment changes significantly, then we reserve the right to reconsider this. And these conditions were met in 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine. The security environment and situation changed radically, and Finland went for the NATO option. So it was actually very consequent in that sense. 
Plus that then uh, one very important psychological moment was in December 2021 when Putin issued this list of demands at NATO, um, including that no new countries should be accepted into the alliance. And this went uh, against the Finnish NATO option policy and was totally unacceptable for a lot of Finns. So that's when the support for NATO membership actually started growing. Um, so there's this interesting psychological effect very often in Finland that whenever the Kremlin tells us what not to do, Finns start thinking maybe this is precisely what we should do. And um, so that's when it started changing. And then it was this moment when Russia invaded Ukraine. It really went overnight that for the first time there was a clear majority, 53% in favor of NATO membership. And the number is actually already 73, uh, 76% uh, if the state leadership were to rec recommend this this option. So um, it was really like the poll was conducted like three to, uh, or, or it came out three to uh, four days after the, the beginning of the full scale invasion. So it was really overnight that this happened or actually already um, in the days preceding the, the um, invasion. So um, that's why Finland, I mean, in the end, Finland ended up joining exactly in the right moment because now everybody understands why we kept the conscription and a big, uh, large reserve-based um, land force and so on. Um, and, and that would have been much harder to justify, let's say, 20 years ago when it was all about out-of-area operations. So um, that's, the, that's the long and the short of uh, why Finland joined NATO when it did, basically. Thank you very much. I think that uh, what uh, Mina has just said is a very good uh, kind of bridge to what I'm uh, going to ask Zbigniew about, because uh, in Poland uh, the same type of considerations were made also on the eve of uh, joining NATO, but this process took place much earlier than in the case of um, uh, Finland. Uh, 1999 was the year when Poland joined NATO. Uh, this was done for, for uh, the very same uh, reasons uh, uh, as in the case of Finland, uh, we were also, Poles were also told that uh, it would not be wise to join NATO, which meant that Poland, many in Poland meant that it was uh, uh, the right moment to join NATO. Uh, Zbigniew, maybe you could uh, share uh, some thoughts about uh, what the Poland's NATO experience uh, has uh, uh, to do with uh, the current situation, how uh, what Poland has learned being a NATO member can uh, uh, be shared with other uh, newer members and uh, uh, how the Polish membership in NATO is about to, uh, and uh, the uh, membership of NATO of Finland and Sweden is going to reshape the security situation in the uh, Baltic uh, Sea region in, in a broader European context. One hour should be enough to respond to your question. But you have only five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, listening to Mina uh, about about uh, Finnish perspective, it reminds me that we we're discussing about Ukraine and uh, Finlandization of Ukraine, and it occurred that we had a Ukrainization, Ukrainization of Finland in, in the end. But, but uh, honestly, uh, first, uh, thank you for, for inviting me and for allowing Polish voice in this, uh, uh, in this region, because I, I have a feeling that uh, for many years, uh, Poles had a stereotype of being Russophobic, which I think uh, is uh, absolutely not true. We are Russo realists, and it's completely different. We are simply immunized from Russian propaganda by our history, and we read their intentions uh, directly, and that's why it's easier for us to interpret what is happening in our neighborhood and how to prepare for it. And it was uh, looking at back from this very recent history, I had this uh, incredible experience uh, because Pulaski Foundation was uh, asked by our American colleagues to, to evacuate some activists from Ukraine in the first days of war, and we established under our, under our umbrella International Center for Ukrainian Victory, which maybe you've heard about the Hanya Hopko, Darek Kalenyuk uh, activities around the globe. And uh, we had this insight what was happening. So we're, we've been a bit, for the last three years, more doers than thinkers. But it was very satisfying because the work that we did over the last 20 years, which was theoretical, suddenly was, uh, uh, suddenly was very practical and needed, and needed now for implementation. So our research about, for instance, uh, military modernization of the Polish armed forces 
immediately become useful because there was a need what post-Soviet equipment is in the neighborhood, the policy paper about what Ukrainians could use on the first day, and which is what is around was written in our offices. And uh, so it was, uh, it was an incredible experience to see firsthand how impactful think tanks can be, how impactful individuals can be, and how unmature our politicians are, and how unprepared they are, and how it's easy to manipulate them, influence them. And I'm encouraging all of us to not withdraw for our, from our beliefs, because uh, the fact that Ukraine is still existing, in my opinion, is the, the outcome of the first that they had the society prepared for it, that they bought the hearts of the international public, that made the pressure on politicians, so they didn't do what usually they do. So they didn't withdraw and say, ah, we'll wait, we'll think about it. The pressure was so big. I, I, I've seen it firsthand uh, with Secretary Blinken coming to Zeshov uh, in the first weeks of war. I was at this meeting, and, uh, and they were not interested in helping, honestly. They were, you know, not even sustaining, just waiting and observing. But the pressure was, was incredible, and uh, what was useful were the delegations of uh, congressmen and senators coming from U.S., were not representing the government, and they came there and they said, well, we are here because our constituency asking is us why our boys are not there helping those poor Ukrainians who were attacked. And those politicians, of course, pragmatically, they decide, okay, let's go to the Ukrainian experience so they could get to the Zeshov. And they met with Ukrainian uh, advocacy representatives, and they, they asked how we can help you. And they said, well, no one is from politicians helping us much from the government. So those senators, one hour later, they took Mr. Blinken for a coffee and asked, Mr. Blinken, you have to do something. You know, we have to do something. And then the, the process started moving. And then there was a press conference when Mr. Blinken said something different than before. And so, on. so I'm tell telling you that uh, the impact could be incredible. And uh, getting back to your question uh, about the Polish perspective, NATO, 2014, like Mina mentioned uh, before, was, uh, was a very, very symbolic date for, for the perspective on our regional security. When Crimea was taken in silence, we realized that there is no understanding what is happening around. And we were at the time thinking about establishing Warsaw Security Forum in Poland as a platform to, to share the Polish Russo-realistic perspective on the threats for European security. And we're thinking, well, let's go the, the it was appealing to have a Munich Security Conference approach. Well, let's have Lavrov at the table, a Putin speech or something would be great from the, you know, organizing perspective. Wow, what, what, what a show. But from the security perspective, we realized that Divide the Impera is that what works the best, and Russia is using it on a daily basis. If we'll give them a platform to speak, they will use it for the propaganda to divide us. So we can invite them to discuss in our premises once we will feel that we are unified among allies in NATO and EU. And there was not this feeling that we speak with one voice. So we decided that Warsaw Security Forum will be from the beginning a platform where we equalize the level of knowledge how to create a common strategy towards Russia. There was no common strategy towards Russia until 2022. We were all divided from the beginning, and it was a very effective tool of influence by Russia. So for the last 11 years, we were doing it, doing, doing, and only on 2022, in February, uh, there was a brief moment of reflection when delegations from Germany, France, UK, and US were coming to Zeshov, <laughs> because it was a Ukrainian capital in exile for, for the first uh, year at least. Uh, all the diplomatic missions moved to Zeshov and all, all from, from Kiev and so on. And it was a moment of reflections where politicians and uh, advisors from all the capitals of the West were coming and saying, well, well, we came here to learn because you Poles, in the end, you, you knew something what we didn't see. 
So tell us what's the Polish perspective on it, and, and so on and so on. And then we had Polish elections, so we screw it all. And uh, so we, we lost the momentum right now after the last elections, so we are regaining it again. But the outcome is we have right now uh, the process of building the largest army in Europe, the third la uh, largest army in NATO after US and Turkey. And it's the answer what our neighborhood means to us. Mm. Unfortunately, it's not a secure neighborhood. And uh, history repeats in our uh, neighborhood. And from our perspective, this neighborhood will, uh, will shape not only our immediate neighbors, but the, the whole global uh, Western um, alliances. Bec and and this, is, this is something what is concerning me. Um, recent uh, advocacy visits to, to Washington, D.C. Uh, were a bit sobering, particularly meeting with Republican colleagues who were um, not seeing connection between uh, victory uh, of Ukraine and uh, American relevance to its partners globally. They don't see this mm -hmm. connection. The only moment or argument what, which was working was China is observing. And if Ukraine fails, falls, China will take a lesson and you will have a problem in, in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And then they were suddenly waking up and, okay, maybe let's, let's pay some attention to it. But, but they were much more concerned about southern border. Of course, you, from their perspective, Ukraine is out of area, southern border is a local problem. But Honestly, why the southern problem is uh, working there? Because people want to aspire and go to the wealthy country. But if Ukraine fails, there will be a domino effect. We will not buy our security insurance in the US. Our big 4.2 GDP defense spending budget will not go all to US. We'll go to South Korea, we'll go to Germany, France, UK, and prosperity in the US will shrink also because of it. And many other countries in defense and other areas will follow the same model. So motivation to emigrate from the south to the north to the US might be different, but I think this is not the way the US colleagues want to solve the problem of the southern border. Mm -hmm. So I think it's better to prove that you have a credibility by defending your values in a country which is really affected by very pure conflict, if you can say. It, the response globally was so vivid because people seen evil, good, aggressor and victim. And me as a Catholic from uh, alumni of Catholic school, listening to the Pope saying that, well, let's both sides withdraw. I'm sorry, I'm sitting behind, uh, between women saying that, but when you see a rape, you don't ask both sides to stop. Mm -hmm. You just uh, you ask the aggressor to stop, and this is so clear situation. And uh, so, uh, well, we are happy to be in NATO for 25 years, and uh, we are very happy that our colleagues from the north are joining us because uh, uh, I believe that um, perspective uh, of our northern uh, colleagues uh, is closer to, mm -hmm. to the Polish perspective more than our colleagues, unfortunately, from Germany and many other uh, Western countries. So uh, I believe it is strengthening the Eastern flank. And this is a strong message uh, to Russia. Mm. And this is another proof that red lines of Russia are not valid. So how many red lines we've heard, uh, Finland joining NATO, will, everything will happen. You cross the border, everything. And so uh, mm. I think, it's strengthening and it's a successful story from the Polish perspective and I believe that it could be a prosperity also for other countries, including Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Kadri, you have been following uh, Russia's uh, turbulent relations with Europe for many years. Uh, I mean to remember that one of the last uh, pu bigger publications that you published was about the growing normative gap between uh, Europe and Russia. And we also know that uh, from the Russian perspective, but also many Western experts and uh, scholars uh, have put the issue of uh, NATO enlargement on the top of the list of uh, uh, the most contentious issues in relations between Russia and the so-called collective West. Uh, uh, how 
how do you see this situation developing in the future, having in mind that Russia still is very skeptical about uh, NATO and about NATO enlargement, now NATO enlarged to involve uh, two, uh, two countries that uh, traditionally uh, belong to another club of uh, nations. Uh, uh, how, what do you read from the Russian statements and from the following Russian uh, public debate, uh, what the future is going to bring, uh, how Russia is uh, uh, about to uh, f deal with this uh, challenge of the ongoing war and uh, how Russia is going to try to rebuild its relations with the West after the end of the war and after the uh, Putin uh, era uh, is going to be there. Please uh, share some of your thoughts with us. We know that uh, it would uh, take uh, not only one day conference, but many days conference, but uh, please, please feel, feel free to uh, use those five, uh, eight minutes to share your thoughts. Ah, now it's eight minutes. <laughs> eight minutes, yes, okay. five. <laughs> the topic is as huge that... <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's um, a bit ironic to be representing Russia, sort of. <laughs> no, no. <the> U <laughs> but, um, I mean, NATO enlargement, it is very sensitive issue in Russia. Uh, that said, I think when it comes to Finland and Sweden, that did not make big news in, in Russia. I think that had been sort of priced in always. Mm -hmm. In Finland and Sweden were nominally neutral countries, but Moscow no, knew very well that that was a sort of strongly Western-leaning neutrality. And Moscow also knew that it lacked any leverage to stop these countries from joining NATO if they so chose. Uh, so we have we have seen very little in, in, in terms of reaction. One thing that I think we are seeing already and um, as a reaction to that um, and might see more in the future is hybrid activities. Mm. Uh, I think Russia is trying to signal uh, to Finland, Sweden, but also other NATO members that don't expect that you can be arming Ukraine and, and feel carefree, happy and safe in your own countries. Mm. Uh, so we see incidents that didn't happen before 2022, like, I mean, Finnish border is largely cl closed. I don't know if there is any border crossing open, maybe not, yeah. And that was because weaponization of immigration from Russia, these things had happened occasionally earlier as well, but earlier it was always possible to settle them, uh, to make Russia to stop it. Uh, now, I mean, Finland had to resort to closing the border. Um, or when I look at Estonia, and I come from Estonia, I, um, mm, I think Estonia was on the receiving end of Russia's hybrid activities early on, so from between 2005 and 2008, when Russia only started experimenting with interference in other countries' foreign policy. Then we had the front soldier crisis and things like that. In contrast, it was my impression, I might be wrong, maybe I don't know everything that has been happening, but it was my impression that from 2014 to 22, Russia was remarkably restrained when it came to the Baltic states. And I think that was because Russia didn't want that area to become securitized. Moscow was trying to signal that we have an issue in Ukraine, but we are not trying to restore the Soviet Union, conquer the Baltic states, etc. And now I can see that that is changing. I mean, recently Russia moved these boys on the Narva River, that is border between Estonia and Russia. And I don't understand why they did that. The, the only reasonable explanation I can have is that they wanted to make us uneasy, as simple as that. Signaling that, you know, we are here, you should, you should watch out. And I think you know, hybrid, hybrid things probably of, of that kind we are going to see more because Russia lacks the self-restraint it might have had before 2022. I have also argued that you know, whatever impact it had on the US election in uh, 2016 was 
not quite intentional. I, my theory is that uh, hacking and leaking democratic emails was Russia's way to try to send a message to President Hillary Clinton, whom they expected to win and be a really tough uh, president when it comes to Russia. So they wanted to signal that, see, you are vulnerable to us too, so watch out. Um, and it ended up bringing uh, Trump to power. That was probably unintended consequence, which also Russia failed to capitalize to the extent they may have wanted. So what I'm trying to say, it wasn't like all out interference back then. However, no, Russia's standoff with the West has come so total that I think many taboos they set themselves early on are now falling. I mean, murders, sabotage, all that we are already seeing, and, and I imagine we will see more of that. Um, things I'm not quite prepared to talk to, but uh, some other people in this room can. Military posture. I'm, I'm sure Russia will adapt its military posture to reflect the fact that Finland and Sweden are in NATO. And there could be regional tensions. You know, if, if Russia feels that uh, its connection to Kaliningrad is somehow endangered or uh, passages from uh, Kronstadt, St. Petersburg to Kaliningrad or out through the Danish Straits, then I think we could see local military crisis as well. But longer term, I think, of course, Russia's strategy will be not to try to offset the effects of NATO enlargement locally, but rather to try to achieve a world order where the dominance of the West and the importance of NATO as such are a lot smaller. I don't think that was the intention from the start. Probably Russia started the war in Ukraine, hoping that Kiev will fall in three days and it will not wreck Russia's overall global relationships, including that with Europe and the West. However, when Kiev didn't fall in three days, Russia condemned itself to a standoff with the West that is now really a major and, and deep one. And I think they are doing everything to make the West um, a smaller power in the future, because that's the only way for Russia to emerge as a victor from that war and to enjoy the, the spoils of the war, because otherwise it will always be sanctioned by the West. Sanctions will always be hindering Russia's economic development. So to make a victory in Ukraine, not to be a Pyrrhic victory, but a real one that presumes diminished rule of the West in, in, in the world. That is the logic. And when you ask how are they planning to rebuild their relationship with the West or Europe, I don't think they are really thinking about it. Mm. I mean, some, some people among expert class might, mm. but it really depends to what extent these people believe the West to be there as an actor in, in the future. Some do, some, some don't. And one thing that I always also keep in mind ever since February 2022, whatever you hear or read by Russian experts, and it's not like they're all doing propaganda and trying to confuse us. No, there are excellent scholars who actually speak their mind if you catch them in a proper trusting setting, etc. However, they don't know Putin's mind. I mean, in February 2022, Putin surprised them as well as us. None of them, none of among Russian foreign policy class expected the war. And so when I see them discussing relationship with the West in the future, and there is discussion. Many people suggest that after US elections, there will be attempts to negotiate with the US, try to settle Ukraine, etc. I always ask myself, is Putin thinking the same? Or is that just experts trying to be rational about the situation? And maybe Putin, you know, he has been in power for 25 years and he had that disastrous COVID uh, is isolation. He really has made himself to believe the sort of things that are not common beliefs among Russian establishment, not, not to mention beyond. Stop here. Yes. I just wanted to comment. 
on that. Oh, thank God, this microphone at least is working. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the border uh, marker uh, question that you mentioned, because I found that was one of the most fascinating hybrid incidents this year. Uh, because So I have no classified information on what actually happened, but it looked to me very much like um, a case of blame the intern. Because it started with uh, this document appearing on the website of the Russian Ministry of Defense, suggesting that the borders, uh, maritime borders with Lithuania and Finland should be reassessed. And then it disappeared after some hours, after it had created a fuss in Finnish like Baltic media. Um, and, and the Kremlin actually was very sort of like, the comment was more of a no comment on that. And then, um, the reaction to that was very interesting, both in Finland and in Lithuania and the other uh, countries around, because we totally sort of like psyoped ourselves into thinking that this was some kind of uh, uh, move of a mastermind and now they're coming for us. Although I really think that it might have been an oversight, like, an act, like, like not intentional to put this document there in that very moment. And my own interpretation is that then they went to Estonia and shifted these border markers to make it look more intentional, because they realized that they have a thing here, uh, that the information uh, dimension of this worked really well, uh, because we all totally panicked. Mm -hmm. mm. It can be. It can be. And, you know, sometimes they are doing these things really unintentionally. I remember, I think it was 2017, um, when the transponderless flights were a topic, and Russia wanted to discuss that. And they invited uh, region, uh, uh, countries from the region to Moscow to, to negotiate. Um, and they invited countries bilaterally, uh, including Estonia. And they invited us in August, you know, in Estonia. Invitation to Moscow in August. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is very much an echo of, of 1939, but of course Russians don't know that. Mm. Or I, I later had the chance of asking Sergei Lavrov, you know, why did you invite us in August? And why did you invite us bilaterally as opposed to with NATO? Because, you know, Estonia doesn't even have fighter jets. It's all NATO fighter jets, but patrol Estonian sky. Lavrov said, yeah, well. mm. <laughs> it was clear that, you know, Russians just lack sensitivity to that historical context, understandably so. But in Estonia, you know, certain dates, certain phrases, certain things make everyone uneasy, almost automatically. Uh, we know that uh, prior to the outbreak of the war in uh, Ukraine, Russia presented two documents on um, their vision of the kind of European uh, security order that would uh, fit uh, Russia. Uh, I expect uh, Russia and some other actors in Europe also to uh, have some thoughts about uh, what uh, security architecture in Europe is going to be built after the end of those uh, hostilities. Uh, can you, you have already said that uh, there is not that much of a debate in Russia about those questions, but this must be a very central topic in Russia because they decided to send the young boys to Ukraine uh, to die in uh, huge numbers on the battlefield in order to achieve uh, something. And uh, my expectation is that they want to uh, change the security architecture uh, uh, in Europe uh, to their liking. What this security architecture could be and what implications this could have uh, for those uh, countries that decided to join NATO. We remember that when Russia presented those documents in, uh, in December 2021, uh, the idea was somehow to roll back NATO to uh, the borders uh, effectively from 1997. Uh, is it still something that uh, Russia wants to achieve or uh, are there any other ideas uh, guiding Russian uh, policies uh, when it comes to building the post-war security architecture in Europe. Uh, we don't uh, expect Russia to disappear, so Russia is going to be a factor that other countries must uh, uh, factor in in their mm -hmm. strategic calculations. But uh, what are the signals coming from Moscow about uh, the wished uh, security architecture in Europe in the uh, post-war uh, configuration? Um, that document you mentioned, it still puzzles me. Mm. I don't understand why was it presented like that. Mm. 
I mean, one option is that they never intended to really negotiate and that was just an excuse to go to the war, uh, possibly. At the time, I didn't think so. At the time, I thought that was a large opening to sort of try to test and see what can be discussed with the West. And, and actually, many things could be discussed because if you remember, Joe Biden offered to Russia that you know, if you don't invade, we could discuss security, mm. including you know, armament limits in Ukraine, etc. And it was actually, you know, it was clear that Ukraine would not be invited into NATO. I mean, uh, debate in the West was rather who should spell it out. Zelensky wanted the West to say that we will not accept Ukraine. The West wanted you, Zelensky to say that, ah, oh, no, we don't want. It was kind of childish. You, mm. NATO enlargement for Ukraine was, was off the agenda at, at the time. So what was that document intended to achieve? And did Putin actually know that diplomacy was working? He was actually achieving many of his ends through that negotiation process. Someone as experienced as Sergei Ryabkov surely could tell him, but was he receptive? I don't know. I mean, I, I hope I will live long enough to, to actually read the archives when they, when they open. I, I would be really curious to learn about that, that story. As concerns the security architecture of the future, I don't think, um, I don't think Russia is, is debating it. Um, uh, in, in any serious manner right now, uh, largely because Russia sees the West as a moving target. Uh, they think we are declining. Uh, they think they are advancing. How far exactly or what exactly will happen and you know, the role that China will play, that is all up, up in the air. And also developments on the battlefield. I mean, it's, it's still unclear how the war will end and that will have implications on, on the security architecture. So my instinct would be to say that Russia sees the current moment as a moment of, for destruction. That's when old arrangements um, collapse or are destroyed. And you can see that actually also in how they don't really engage in strategic uh, talks with the United States. They, they signal very clearly that you cannot expect that we will discuss nuclear weapons with you while you keep arming Ukraine against us. They refuse to compartmentalize. US has tried to keep the strategic dialogue going while disagreeing on Ukraine. Russia is not having any of this. And my question also is, you know, to what extent is there any part of the treaty base uh, between Russia and the US they still want to keep? Uh, or is it, you know, who cares? We will, we will build a new and better one once the dust settles. But mostly I think they are focused on winning the war and, uh, and, and diplomacy comes after the war. So also, if you look how marginalized the Russian foreign ministry is in Russia's political system, that actually shows you that they are not really intending to discuss anything in a serious manner anytime soon. It was very illuminating to me when I read biography of, um, of Anatoly Dobrynin, a legendary Russian ambassador to the US, and he joined the MFA, um, or MFA training in 1944, that was when Stalin had realized that the war will soon be over, we will need good diplomats to, do, to discuss the new world order, and that inspired a new intake of people into foreign ministry. So I think when we see Kremlin investing a little bit more in diplomacy, then that might be one of the signs that they are getting ready to discuss something in serious, seriously, or maybe not, because Putin's mindset could, could also be different. You know, his world is world of Yalta, where you just need Churchill and Roosevelt uh, to discuss matters, um, and, and your policy is backed up by special operations rather than diplomacy. So, you know, mm. maybe I'm, I'm waiting for that sign in vain, but, but in any case. 
Uh, I think that one of the objectives, and it's not only my thinking, I think uh, that I have read it in many uh, do Russian documents, uh, and uh, this could also be read from many Russian statements and uh, uh, measures taken by Russia that uh, uh, undermining the cohesion and unity of uh, Western institutions like NATO and uh, the European Union is one of the uh, short-term objectives because uh, the expectation is that once uh, the unity is gone, then uh, uh, there is not going to be unison approach uh, to, towards the war in, in Ukraine and the Western support to Ukraine is going to disappear and this will uh, facilitate uh, Russia achieving its kind of uh, objectives towards Ukraine. But we know uh, from uh, uh, the recent history that uh, undermining uh, the uh, unity and cohesion of NATO is not something uh, that only Russia uh, has played a part in over the past uh, uh, decade. Uh, we are uh, most probably going to see the results of the uh, uh, elections in the United States uh, and uh, to what extent uh, Russia is waiting for uh, Trump to uh, come back and uh, what uh, impact uh, Trump is going to have on uh, the internal cohesion of the West and on the West ability and the willingness to uh, provide uh, support that Ukraine needs in order to not the lose the uh, uh, war. Uh, Zbigniew, maybe you could uh, share uh, some of your thoughts about uh, uh, the impact of the elections in the United States. We know also that there is a kind of uh, Polish uh, card being played in the elections. Uh, there are two uh, forces in Poland, uh, one uh, most probably uh, uh, preferring uh, uh, Harris to win and the other one uh, still having some thoughts about uh, Trump and his uh, possible positive impact on uh, the situation in Europe. Uh, who, how, how does the uh, issues look like from the Polish perspective uh, uh, what the impact of uh, the uh, elections in the United States is going to be on European security and transatlantic cooperation that are uh, two things that the Polish uh, current government is very interested in and which is also something that is going to impact on the situation of many other governments. Mm. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, it's a very relevant question. We are just uh, uh, almost a couple of days uh, before the elections. Uh, well, there's a common question, uh, what keeps you awake at night? Um, I would prefer that <coughs> this question is reversed to Russia, what keeps them awake at night? And the, mm -hmm. the answer is NATO. Unfortunately, it's not always like that, because uh, the strongest, the strongest uh, pillar of NATO is US. Mm -hmm. uh, I was once at the close meeting of uh, one of the uh, Baltic uh, country um, uh, meeting with one of the presidents, a uh, woman president of the Baltic country, and, and there were American colleagues, some generals in it, and, and she's, she was asked by w one of those American colleagues, uh, um, well, are you happy that our troops are right now in the Baltic uh, countries? And she said, yes, she's very happy, but, uh, mm, but I'm not so excited about the gentleman that is uh, sitting in the White House, and I'm not sure that, uh, that he knows where the Baltic countries are. Yeah. And um, I didn't understand it precisely at the time, but someone from MFA of this country came later to me and said, well, there was a meeting of three presidents of Baltic states with President Trump, and uh, when he entered the room with his three presidents, uh, he started bashing them. Oh, how you could do this and that, you know, those atrocities, fighting among each other and so on and so on. They were looking at each other, what is happening here? And then someone came, no, not Balkan countries, Baltic countries. Oh, okay. So he had his knowledge about the Balkan countries based on his probably education from his wife, but uh, not necessarily <coughs> his knowledge about the region. So it matters who is in the White House. Yeah. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was meeting in a Heritage Foundation with uh, some of the senior leaders of them, uh, and they said, uh, kind of decalogue of Mr. Trump, what he likes, what he does not, and what, he, how we, what we should do as Europe, and so on. And there was one important thing to me, when uh, they said that uh, for Mr. Trump, who is a transactionist, uh, 
when Europeans are spending its uh, money on defense in frame of European projects, like EU, for instance, it's a red flag for him. Mm. You know, for me, clear answer is if Texas is spending on its own defense, it's not against the United States of America. But well, mm. but these are the differences that we can expect. Depends who is in the White House. From the Central Eastern European perspective, I believe the answer is clear uh, that Kamala Harris is more convenient for us. I'm not saying that she's the best candidate for president for the United States. Mm. I'm talking about our pragmatic interests of the region. First, you don't change the leader at war. Mm. The transition of the political establishment, it, it will be anyhow with the change of the government, <coughs> but it will be even more and longer and deeper if we'll have a change from Democrats to Republicans. It's the first one. Second, uh, if you take a look at uh, advisors, because it matters in this case, J.D. Vance with his national security advisor, who is kind of, uh, I was sharing it yesterday, that it's a man of Yalta and Potsdam mentality who would trade us uh, for some pennies mm -hmm. immediately. This is scary to me. Mm -hmm. And Mr. J.D. Vance has no competences about foreign policy. So the advisor is influential. And on the other hand, we have uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Phil Gordon, who is national security advisor to her. And this is a gentleman, <laughs> even at least at the Warsaw Security Forum, we hosted him twice or three times. And he said that, wow, it opened his eyes of the significance of the region. So he was not educated, but at least right now we can say that he knows something about the region and he is more genuine about it. And if we take a look at the, some uh, gestures, to have a peace in one day, come on, who believes in it? I, I can imagine that someone could sell us in one day, yes, but not to get a victory in one day, mm. because that's what matters for our region. Mm. And on the other hand, we have Mr. J.D. Vance criticizing uh, Ukraine extensively, and Mr. Waltz, who is signing uh, uh, cooperation agreements with uh, regions uh, of Ukraine mm -hmm. about rebuild. So the, the, the answer is quite, quite, quite easy. Mm -hmm. If you'd make a step back, eight, or almost right now, 12 months back, uh, six months it took, or even more, for uh, House of Representatives to adopt the bill for Ukrainian, uh, for, uh, uh, um, the bill to support Ukraine six months. It mattered. Mm. It was that time that was given to Russia to fortify trenches, which was then the reason why the counteroffensive was, was not, not effective. Mm. We know from the Polish perspective what liberum veto means. Mm. And we know the consequences, which in our case, it was 123 years of Russian occupation and last, uh, losing the, the sovereignty. So in U.S. capital, when we've seen that there is a support for this, for this bill, but still they were not able to pass it for six months, mm. wow, this is, if this is the projection of Republican policy on Ukraine and the region, uh, mm. I, I vote for Harris. <laughs> but it's their decision. Okay. And the answer to it is we are Europeans. Mm. Mm. We have to think about our, what we can do. So that's why Poland is building a large army. That's why we are thinking about European projects. It's not against U.S. Actually, it's fulfilling Mr. Trump's request. Mm -hmm. Take care about your own security. Mm -hmm. And we know this, <laughs> this saying that either you pay for your security or f someone else will do, but you might not like it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we want to like our mm -hmm feeling of security and it's better to have it in our own hands, not to be dependent what American voters mm. will uh, decide about our chances of uh, having a strategic partner or not. So, so, so this. Uh, but at the same time, just one reflection to what, what, what was said before about um, security architecture. Uh, well, Yes, I can imagine uh, secure cooperation with, with Russia, but first, there cannot be peace at any cost. Mm. There must be a genuine peace. Mm. 
with defense of our values, not sacrificing uh, sovereignty or independence of the countries, because then it's against our values. Then it will be invitation for other authoritarian regimes to move forward. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I think about what Russians will have to experience, they need to experience, many experts say it, uh, they need to experience a, a collapse of their leadership because this is the only moment when the people were, that were oppressed have a chance for, to feel that there is a justice. If they will not have the perspective of justice, apathy in the society will be permanent and we cannot see in Russia a partner to cooperate with. So there has to be a moment of justice for those that were sacrificing or protesting against the regime in Russia. Without Russia experiencing this kind of transition or momentum, there is no hope. And if there is no hope, I don't have a hope that this is, it is a trusted partner. Mina, Thank you. Mina, you represent a country that uh, has um, benefited greatly from uh, uh, collapse in Russia as uh, all other members of this panel do because uh, both the Poland regaining independence, Estonia getting independence in 1918, uh, Finland getting independence in 1918, uh, all those countries uh, were reborn or born as a result of the collapse in uh, Russia. But uh, still, uh, uh, you have uh, you joined NATO for uh, uh, less than two years ago, and then we face a situation when uh, NATO, due to developments not necessarily caused by Russia, but by the internal dynamics in uh, the main NATO country, United States, can become much less relevant. And one of the ways of addressing this uh, uncertainty is to uh, strengthen the European leg of uh, security policy, of security cooperation, which is uh, already happening, but also after the uh, enlargement of NATO to Finland and Sweden, uh, the Nordic dimension of uh, security could also get some new boost uh, because we know that the, the traditional there have been several attempts at uh, boosting uh, security cooperation among the Nordic countries but due to the fact that uh, Norway and Denmark uh, decided to join NATO in 1949 while uh, Sweden and Finland decided to stay neutral this was not uh, the case now we have a situation where all uh, the Nordic countries are members of uh, uh, NATO club and uh, uh, three of those Nordic countries are members of the European Union and Norway is uh, working very closely with the European Union on many strategic aspects of cooperation. So could you say a few words about how this uh, NATO membership of uh, Finland and Sweden uh, can boost this uh, Nordic cooperation on security since we all face this uh, 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 more uh, challenging uh, Russian uh, 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 policy? This is actually a very, very nice question. Thank you for that, because um, one of the most positive uh, side effects that uh, that Russia's disastrous decisions in the past years have had has been this new momentum in the Nordic security cooperation uh, and defense cooperation, especially. Um, so there's a there's a lot of momentum. There are a lot of happening. It's sometimes even hard to like stay up to date because so much is happening. So if until um, the Finnish and Swedish decision to join NATO, Norway and Denmark were a little bit like holding back in the NordEFCO format, the Nordic defense cooperation format. Uh, now they are very forward leaning and and very eager to to build this like. Uh, um, actually even go into not only cooperation but even integration of our, our, our military forces uh, in the region and it's it's very vital also in this region because um, if you look at Finland, Sweden, Norway, we are all large countries in terms of territory but with small populations and uh, that's quite a challenge in terms of territorial defense that's also the reason why Finland has kept up this conscription based uh, reserve army and and why also Norway and and Sweden reintroduced conscription um, after having posted after the cold war and are trying to also uh, increase the number of their uh, available troops so so that's very important like maybe one of the most significant developments was in 2023 when the air forces uh, announced that they will start um, integrating their forces into this kind of really interoperable force, like not one uh, joint Nordic Air Force, but nevertheless uh, to have the ability to really flexibly operate in, in the whole region. And of course, NATO has now also the new regional defense plans um, 
where the Nordics <coughs> are one one sort of like uh, joint operational area. Uh, so, so there's a lot happening there, and uh, a lot of things are going into the right direction. And I would say that uh, also the Nordics have been um, like outside supporters of Ukraine. Uh, so also, of course, like Poland was. It was incredibly important, especially what you mentioned in the beginning with this old Soviet equipment and mm -hmm. and, uh, and other things that Poland uh, was able to give also the Baltic states. Uh, their support uh, was incredibly important in the beginning. And then the Nordic countries have really stepped up over the past two and a half years. And, and now uh, the Nordic countries uh, in total are, I think, um, the, um, the, the second lar largest military supporter of Ukraine after the US, because in terms of just military support, uh, the Nordic countries have supported Ukraine with more than, for example, Germany. Uh, although our combined GDP is significantly smaller than Germany's. So that has been very important. And what has happened there, for example, is also in terms of uh, defense production. So uh, the lack of ammunition has been a huge issue for Ukraine and, and it will would be for all of Europe. And uh, the Nordics have, for example, really invested in the in the uh, production of am ammunition in the in the region, both for the regional needs and for Ukraine. And, and there's this uh, EU comes into play here with this uh, one of the best acronyms, ASAP, Act in Support of Ammunition Production, uh, which has been utilized here as well. So uh, that's like one of the most positive um, situations. And then maybe to get back to uh, one question that Kadri actually posed about like the Russian reaction to, to all this and military adaptation. Uh, Russia already in 20, uh, I think it was late 2022, uh, when Shoigu um, announced that Russia will re-establish these two military districts, Leningrad and, and Moscow, very close to the Finnish border. However, so far from Finland, we don't see anything materializing there yet. So it seems that these, uh, these districts are still very much in exile only, and, um, and Russia has not been able to yet uh, reconstitute its power. So um, there was an assessment uh, by the Finnish military intelligence that they have um, like withdrawn or, or like not withdrawn but drawn to Ukraine about 80 percent of uh, of uh, pre 2022 troops and equipment along the bases uh, uh, at the Finnish border. So so this is a significant reduction um, in the military capability, which leads to actually this very funny discrepancy between Finland and Sweden. That uh, in Sweden um, there's been a lot of talk about the security situation being the worst since the Second World War, and in Finland we're kind of like it's never been better because <laughs> there's much less uh, much less. Um, Russian military capability at our border, and we're in NATO, and our own armed forces are also now better equipped than than ever before. So, so it really depends on the perspective, uh, <laughs> whether the glass is half full or half empty. But yeah, so um, and the Nordic countries are like here. Uh, the the developments are very positive, and um, and it's precisely also what you were talking about earlier that we are trying to also signal to the U.S. that that we take our uh, security seriously, and and we do try to sort of um, make sure that we are able to be the first responders in our own region. And in Finland, we are fully aware that with or without NATO, we will have to defend ourselves first and foremost. And then we're happy if somebody comes and helps out at some point. But like that's uh, sort of it. And what just what comes to the, this um, risk about the US maybe withdrawing or not being as effective as, as, as has been hoped um, in Finland, the, uh, support for NATO is incredibly high right now. Um, in opinion polls, it's somewhere around 85%. Uh, so we're very much still in the honeymoon phase, I, I believe. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, there is also this growing um, like concern, of course, for the, the results of the US elections. And, and there's this, this understanding that it's not only a Trump problem, it's not only a problem now, but it will be also in the future. Like if every four years, like the whole alliance is in question and so on. So there's a little bit this kind of feeling that like, were we so late to the party, that we kind of missed the party uh, mm -hmm. by, by joining NATO so late and and mm -hmm. then maybe the whole whole thing kind of like uh, <laughs> just uh, well I, I would I would like to believe that that NATO is, is stronger than that and uh, and that the US also pulls through but there's there are great uncertainties about that since if we I are talking about the party I think that uh, we need to open for uh, uh, audience because uh, we have only 10 minutes left and uh, the topics that we have been discussing are so important uh, for many in this uh, room that uh, I would like to first open for uh, the audience and then maybe we'll have uh, some time to have some uh, concluding remarks please uh, feel free to ask any uh, possible and impossible questions we will do our best to address those questions in uh, the uh, hell is uh, in the best manner possible. Yes, Matthew. Guy. Okay. 
Yes, uh, thank you for your excellent discussions. Um, I have a question concerning hybridity. Uh, Kader Leek was touching upon this. Uh, so this is something that you definitely could see also in other areas of the Baltic region and also in, in the high north. So more specifically uh, to the representative from Finland, there is the issue of, of migration and border issues, for instance. So what are the concrete uh, challenges that you're facing on that particular issue and, and, and what are the response mechanisms? Thank you. Uh, maybe you can answer. Um, so yes, there's. Um, this was actually one thing that Finland uh, expected Russia to do as a response to the uh, NATO membership, because actually you you did mention it, but but this was not the first time that Russia did such an operation at the border. The first time was in 2015. Mm. Um, it was along the Finnish and the Norwegian border with mm. these so-called uh, bicycle um, refugees that came mm. on bikes over the border, and and that was uh, the first test case. And then the same strategy was utilized also at the, the Polish uh, and Lithuanian Belarusian borders, and also I believe Latvia mm. to an extent. Um, so since 2015 and 16, uh, when at that time, as Kadri also mentioned, it was still possible to sort of solve it with Russia in a bilateral way um but but now uh, one reason why finland just closed the border and didn't even try um do going it going about it this way was that like no finnish president wants to call putin at the moment like uh, there's no interest mm -hmm. in in doing so and um so so the situation was that as soon as the war started going better uh, for Russia last fall, like about a year ago, after the Ukrainian counter-offensive counter in the summer of 2023 sort of like didn't result uh, in as much gains as, as was hoped. Um, as soon as Russia had capacity left, and there was a very clear cor correlation, I think, here, because until then we had been sort of like wondering in Finland, like why, why didn't Russia do anything about us joining NATO? And also during the period when we were waiting for the accession, nothing basically happened. We even had less airspace violations than normally, so it was kind of weird. And um, so, so then they started, and they started bringing like large amounts of uh, migrants to the border and uh, taking away their uh, mostly from uh, Northern Africa and Middle East, and taking away their papers and then sending them over the border to the Finnish side. And Finland reacted, and, and this had been actually um, in preparation f since 2015, so also the, the previous governments. These were not only the current right-wing government, but the previous and their left government had already worked on the changes in the border laws so that this would be possible in the first place. So there had been quite a lot of preparation work put into this to be able to respond uh, in this fashion. Um, and the border has remained closed basically ever since. Um, no, the trickier question here was um, then over the summer this very he heatedly debated uh, pushback law that Finland um, Finland uh, now has. So um, there has always been this issue, not only in Finland, but also in Poland and, and also in Southern Europe, that pushbacks are illegal. So Finland tried sort of like paradoxically to legalize the illegal pushbacks by uh, sort of um, legislating a law that is also in contradiction with our own constitution, but that was made as an exemption to the constitution, so so that was all right, but there remains this, this unfortunate uh, contradiction to international law and human rights. Uh, so so this shows that there's also this moral and, uh, and, and uh, legal dimension to this question, mm -hmm. that it's uh, completely impossible to solve it in a completely clean way that doesn't infringe on anybody's uh, human rights, rights that is like in, in line with international law and probably your domestic law, uh, and that also is like uh, in line with your security needs, so um, th this has been proven like really one of the one of the trickiest uh, hybrid operations to respond to actually mm. because of that. If I could jump in, because it's 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 quite broad pro problem in Poland as well, the border uh, control and uh, the Polish Prime Minister initiative to uh, suspend uh, to suspend uh, the right to apply for asylum at the border crossing with Poland between Belarus and, and Poland. Not at, in Poland, but at the border, specifically. Uh, I would say like this, we have weaponization of migration and we have weaponization of human rights. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, our values are exploited by our enemies. Mm -hmm. And those international laws, which are about these aspects, are simply uh, written, they were written, uh, in different times. We also don't have the, we haven't had for a long time uh, laws which were about uh, uh, hate 
in uh, social media. Mm -hmm. But now we have, mm -hmm. because it is a real place where people are harmed. And that's the same right now. Those immigrants are simply utilized for uh, as a weapon, human weapon, mm -hmm. against uh, the country. So, so I think it's fully justified. However complicated it is, I, I was living in Australia and I've seen these Nauru trips, mm -hmm. uh, the, taking the boats with families to the kind of concentration camps. But unfortunately, realities are like this: that some uh, villain countries, uh, in this case Russia, are using it and instrumentalizing it. So, uh, so, so, so we have to we have to we have to do uh, something um, uh, about it but just one 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 remark i wanted to make before uh, to, before subject about us and fact that we are spending and investing in our security uh, fact that europeans are spending and taking care about its security is not a success of the us mm. uh, it's not a sign that they they, they that they were effective it's unfortunately a proof uh, that they were ineffective and they threatened us to the moment that we had to take care and wake up, which is in some sense, of course, good, but it's mm. not American success. Mm. It's, uh, from mm. political perspective, it's, uh, it's, 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 it was... It's Vladimir Putin's success, in a way. Uh, yeah. Matthew, you had a question. Yeah, very nicely. Does the mic work? Yeah, speaking of, you mentioned something about, um, well, you cautioned against a peace deal in Ukraine that would basically satisfy Russia's war aims, uh, because this would you equate that with the fall of Ukraine. And then you mentioned a domino effect. Um, now, of course, the domino effect or domino theory was quite prevalent in justifying the prolongation of the Vietnam War, and it was rather vague that somehow communism would spread through Asia. Subsequently, that didn't happen after the fall of South Vietnam. So. Um, but I thought you might have a more clear articulation of what you mean by the domino effects in the context of Central and Southeastern Europe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, uh, for me, it's pretty clear, honestly. And uh, the domino effect will be that uh, if we allow uh, authoritarian regime to change the borders, which in our uh, community of values in EU and NATO are kind of saint, or at least we want to perceive them as really uh, binding, uh, then we'll have every other authoritarian regime to use it as an excuse to undermine borders in their neighborhoods. And the first one, and we see it in Poland, you know, who are the very frequent uh, visitors to Poland, are the Taiwanese delegations. There is a reason for that. They know that they are next, that if Ukraine loses significantly and Russia is not punished for their brutal attack, the Taiwan will be next. It's as simple as that. And for the whole American uh, Pax Americana, it will be the, the beginning of the composition of Pax Americana, losing credibility in Ukraine. And as long as uh, American colleagues will not understand it, uh, they are losing. It's a perception. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the, the difference between uh, us as the West and Russians, that for decades we were naming Russia a challenge, uh, a difficult partner. And they, in their doctrines, were naming us enemy. Mm. So it means that they were already winning because they were adjusting to the perception that we are enemy for them. So uh, we can, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's why I mentioned in the beginning uh, Crimea. Because, you know, what was the fact that Crimea was taken in silence? It was the, mean, the, the signal that our uh, political leaders, unfortunately, were cowards that they were not able to take the responsibility what is happening in their neighborhood mm. and name aggressive war a war. Mm. We can use a different mm. words which delegate uh, responsibility away from us, mm. but it doesn't change the, the wind. Mm. So if we don't adjust the sails, 
<laughs> the wind will not change, you know. We just have to, I think we are in the country of sailors, so you know what I'm talking about. Mm. I'm an old sailor. Old for I, 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 think, I think that uh, uh, in the first place it's time but, to uh, I will wrap up. You, yeah? I will tell you, uh, okay, uh, to, to okay. conclude my, my remarks uh, um, as, as the final words. Uh, there was a mentioning of Kostachev, uh, someone mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I, I asked him uh, at the conference organized by Angela Stant uh, in Rand Corporation in 2007, I think. And he was uh, leading the delegation there. And I was a naive uh, youngster uh, asking him, uh, well, sir, mm, can you envision Russia and NATO? Uh, being a member of NATO. And it was a time when there was some crazy concepts that Russia, crazy, very, you know, unique concept that Russia might consider being, you know, it was a, you know, NATO-Russia uh, partnership agreement and so on. And he, he started, like, looking into the ceiling and said, like, well, we would have to do this, we would have to do that, we have to amend that, that. And then suddenly he, like, oh, like, he woke up where he is, and, oh, but of course we'll never do that. <laughs> Which meant that to me at that time, how I felt it, felt it, that they, they, the re reflection of Putin's policies, uh, reflection of mm, rejected society, and and this is probably our mistake that we didn't find a way to have them inside, and that they they are right now this bully mm. that want to destroy our peace, and we cannot allow it, mm. and with the Ukrainians, and this is the last story, with the Ukrainians, uh, you mentioned that they were uh, effectively absorbing this uh, post-Soviet weapon. Uh, I remember one of the police, uh, I will not use the name, but this, this was a woman, and Ukrainian women are incredible during this war as a policy advocate. And uh, they were visiting Poland, and uh, it was a cameral meeting with Polish politicians, and I was offering a tea, uh, trying to be a gentleman. Uh, do you want a tea? And, and she said, well, hmm, now I can drink a tea. And I said, like, what, what, what does it mean? And I said, well, it was Wednesday or Thursday. And I, I said, well, we arrived with our delegation on Monday. And I told your government that until you will uh, allow trans, tra transition um, um, supply of your 300, and then it was not clear how many, but it was more than 300 tanks supply to Ukraine. I will not eat or drink. Hmm. But, okay. but today I can drink it. Okay, very good. And uh, it was announced later that Poland uh, gave a green light. So, so they are worth to to help them. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all of uh, you for joining us here. I can also mention that we had also our own experience with Kosachev. He came to Norway on a kind of good uh, will visit, and he started his conversation with the group of uh, Norwegian experts working on Russia by saying that you must uh, understand that if you uh, don't do that and that, we will uh, aim our missiles at your uh, facilities in Varda. This was this, his opening remark uh, on the goodwill uh, visit to uh, Norway. So, so, so I think that uh, uh, and what uh, uh, Kadri said about the role of Putin in uh, the process of launching uh, of the war in Ukraine is also something that uh, is a very representative example of uh, uh, the different uh, strategic cultures uh, in the West and in Russia. In Russia decisions uh, were the, the most uh, crucial and important decision was made by one man who even uh, was not supported by his closest uh, uh, aides. They were somehow forced to uh, come with their declarations at this very famous meeting of the Security Council. Uh, in, the, in our countries, at least, we like to uh, think uh, this, that uh, those decisions are taken by people who are accountable and uh, know that they will pay a political price if they don't uh, take uh, right decisions. And uh, I think uh, that this is also a very good way of uh, concluding this discussion. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking an active part in this uh, debate and we hope very much to see you as many or even more of, uh, more of you next year. Next year we are going to have also a Russia conference uh, uh, and we now even know what the topic is going to be. The topic of the next year's Russia conference is going to be Russian power practices in the MENA region uh, but we will also uh, discuss Russian power practices in the 
broader context because uh, what is happening in the MENA region is only one of the arenas where Russia... Uh, it will be about new government of Russia. Well, let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. Thank you very much for coming and uh, looking very much forward to continuing this uh, discussion. <laughs>